Welcome to your Artsy Girl podcast. I am your host, Christina Carrere. This is a podcast about art, poetry, and anything about creativity. Sit back, relax, and get your dose of brain food to get your creative juices flowing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to your Artsy Girl podcast. I'm your host, Christina Carrere. Yes, we are trucking along on this podcast schedule thing. This is now episode three. My guest artist today is poet Barbara Jane Reyes. I will open this segment with a short biography of my featured guests as an introduction, if you will, before I go on and start to pick her brains a little and have fun learning about all the fascinating things about her and her work. Barbara Jane Reyes is the author of Invocation to Daughters by City Lights Publishers, 2017. She was born in Manila, Philippines, raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, and is the author of four previous collections of poetry, Gravities of Center by Archipelago Books, 2003, Poeta in San Francisco, Tin Fish Press, 2005, which received the James Laughlin Award of the Academy of American Poets, Diwata Boe Editions Limited, 2010, which received the Global Filipino Literary Award for Poetry, and To Love as Aswang, Philippine American Writers and Artists, Incorporated, 2015. She is also the author of the chapbooks Easter Sunday, Ipolita Press, 2008, Cherry, Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs, 2008, and for the city that nearly broke me, Aslan Libre Press, 2012. Her sixth book, Letters to a Young Brown Girl, is forthcoming from Boa Editions Limited in 2020. Her work is published or forthcoming in Arroyo Literary Review, Asian Pacific American Journal, As Us, Boxcar Poetry Review, The Brooklyn Rail, Chain, 1111, Entropy, Fairy Tale Review, 14 Hills, Hambone, Cardico Review, among others. An Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellow, she received her BA in Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley and her MFA at San Francisco State University. She is an adjunct professor at University of San Francisco Uchenko Philippine Studies Program. She has also taught at San Francisco State University and Mills College. She lives with her husband, poet Oscar Bermeo, in Oakland. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for coming on the show to Hi talk there. to me. <laughs> Thanks also, for having me. Long yes, intro. <laughs> absolutely. Well, because you've done so much. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> Although we haven't personally met, I feel we've been longtime acquaintances, especially through Facebook and uh, various listservs online throughout the years. But because we, we kind of roll with the same crowd of Filipino American poets and writers, you've amassed That's tremendous. The- yeah, yeah. You've amassed tremendous amount of work. And I want to congratulate you on your forthcoming poetry collection, Letters to a Young Brown Girl. Can you tell us a little bit about how you conceptualize this collection and how it evolved? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's so much. Yeah, and we have been part of that same FLIPS listserv that's been around yes. since I feel like the <laughs> 90s or something. So um, let's see. Um, letters to a Young Brown Girl. Yes, that is coming out next year. You know, I did this thing. I've been crowdsourcing a lot, and that's one good mm-hmm. thing that I've been able to do on social media is just put out questions. And and basically, my question was to all Filipinas who would read my social media post, what do you need to ask me? Mm. You know, and it could be about anything. And um, so there were a lot of questions, you know, about being a Pinay, navigating American literature, navigating um, American poetry uh, scenes and um, workshops and those kinds of things. And then a lot of questions just about how much of yourself and your ethnicity do you put into your work? Um, is it okay to be so ethnic? Those kinds of things. Mm. And so um, I wrote from that place, answering those questions. And, um, you know, and, it, it, and they were so, and for me, answering those questions put me back in this place where 
I was 18 or 19 again and, and still writing poems in my, my private journals, yes, right? Young and, brown and, girl. Yes, yes. exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's where it came from. Well, I've tried my darnest to buy and support other poets and writers' books, but through the lack of time and sometimes lack of funds, I can't buy all of them as much as I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I'm finding that one of the perks of featuring guest artists is that I'm I get to see some of the works and spend time with it prior to the you know, especially to this interview. And I'm amazed by the high caliber of work I get to read. I didn't expect any less than that, of course, but what I'm trying to say is that I'm honored to have you come on and spend time with me in the audience. Um, oh, you were, you. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. You were born in the Philippines and then immigrated to the U.S. just like me. Yeah. 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 Yep. When I was read your bio. But when I, I went to the East Coast, the New England area, Connecticut to be exact, and you went to the West Coast. Yep. Oakland. What, were you like in the 90s? <laughs> Or eighties, um, eighties, seventies, and eighties. That's pretty cool. I was, I was thinking about like, cause Bino, uh, Riolio is in East yeah. Coast, I, you know, and I, I met Eileen up there too. Um, mm-hmm. So <laughs> we should have an East Coast West Coast battle. <laughs> oh my god! Don't even. Oh my god! Don't even start. That's so funny. <laughs> well, you I, know, it's yeah. funny because on Facebook. <laughs> Like, what was that? It was a meme. It was like a stack of old school tapes, you know. And it oh had my like, God, I, yeah, nine, all my old mixtapes. It had Tupac, and, you know, and everybody was like debating which ones they liked best. And it was the like East Coast, West Coast thing. That's awesome. <laughs> and yeah, and out here we had, um, for me, my favorite rapper in the 90s was a guy from the Bay Area named Paris. And oh my God, oh. He, he was dope. You should look him up. It was awesome. Yes. Anyway, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So speaking of rappers, mm-hmm. uh, Ruby Ibarra, the mm-hmm. up and coming Filipina American rapper, you had noted that in one of her videos, she had one of your books in the bookshelf. <laughs> Yeah, you, you're pretty amazing, How cool right? Is that? But, well, it was super cool, and it was a whole shelf full of books written by um, Philam writers uh-huh. and scholars. So, you know, like Don Mabalon's book was there, and Janice Sapigao, and you know, and and it was just such a wonderful gesture. Right. But um, Ruby is, you know, she's so respectful that way, you know, she always says, you know, um, you know, you folks are my ates and, um, Mm. you know, and I don't think I've ever met her in person, but just over um, email and social media, just the kind of respect that she pays to her elders, I think is just so it's so touching to me. And she's just so good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even though she, you know, she's like hardcore, you know, and mm-hmm. I just absolutely love that. It, it's mm-hmm. so refreshing. Mm-hmm. It to yeah. me, yeah. it's so refreshing to, yeah. to see that, you know, when we have that whole stereotype of the me, you know, subservient types, you know, and that that stereotype. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that we aren't sweet and kind and all that. <laughs> oh no, you can't tell anybody that I'm sweet and kind. <laughs> 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 so Barbara, how old were you when you came to the States? I was very young. I came here when I was two and oh. I was um yeah, super, super young. I was talking to my students about this the other day and usually elders when they ask me that and I say I was two, they usually say, Oh, so you're not really Filipino. No, anyway. no, yeah, yeah. I, I hear that yeah. a lot. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I grew up there. Actually, I, I left when mm-hmm. I was 18. And um, I was mm-hmm. telling Eileen, probably was in the first step, uh, second episode, um, when mm-hmm. I had her on, how, you know, I, I, I grew up there, but I couldn't, I didn't speak the language just uh, fluently, mm. because I was kind of enculturated that way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's weird how the diaspora is, 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 yeah. is it's the variables that work in, yep. in in our lives that way. Differences. And then we have the commonalities, of course. When I think of San Francisco, I think of, you know, the beat poets. No, City Lights Books was my mm-hmm. go-to and, and my model, right. right? And that was that was the end-all, be-all of it for me, right? <laughs> like, that's what poetry was. Um, and so, you know, obviously, Howl is, is a big deal for me as much as Diane de Prima's um, revolutionary letters, as much mm-hmm. as Ann Waldman's fast speaking woman, you know, um, those wow. are like, 
I needed to be there at City Lights. And Jessica Hagedorn also came up in that same, you know, uh, yeah, in that yeah. kind of general area. So, um, you know, so that's what San Francisco Poetics has always meant for me. And then if you want to add to that, of course, you have to add to it the flips, the, you know, the Phil and poets that came up here, like Manong Al Robles, um, mm-hmm. Jaime Asinto, Jeff Tagami, Shirley, and Chetta, you know, um, and those folks were writing really like, um, oh my God, just such vibrant poetry that was rebellious and it was beautiful and it was unapologetic. And, you know, that's what I wanted for, for myself as a poet. So mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. If, if that's a symptom of being from the Bay Area, then hell yeah, totally. Reading your work, I, I mean, I see that aesthetics, but also a lot of layers. It's very lyrical and, and um, mm-hmm. uh, it just, it, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. So how long have you been teaching at University of San Francisco and what's the name of the courses you teach over there? Uh, you know what? Would you believe it's been 10 years now? I think this is my 10th <gasps> year there. Wow. Um, yeah, yes. crazy. Um, I have been in the Yuchenko Philippine Studies program and I've been teaching the literature classes there. So um, in the fall, I teach Pinay Lit. Filipina Mm -hmm. lit. It's focused entirely on Filipina women and girls. And uh, that's a lower Mm -hmm. division class. And I get all of these young folks who come into the class who've never read anything by a Filipino before, a book at least. Big, wide eyes. And, you know, um, and then I realized this is like the only place in the country you will ever, ever take a class called Filipina lit with 40 other students. Right. Mm. Um, And then in the spring, which would be now, I teach an upper division uh, Filipino lit class. And so we do read Nick Joaquin and Carlos Bolosan, um, you know, and and, um, it's 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 a terrible amount of fun. I love it. I totally love it. Even among young Filipinos and Filipinas, they find it strange kind of to kind of discover. Um, maybe, maybe strange isn't the word that it's new to them, right? Uh Like Uh we all come from very, very similar school systems in this country where, you know, diversity in literature rarely ever means a a Filipino writer, right? So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, every once in a while I'll find, you know, one of my students say, Oh, I read Cecilia Brainard or something, and that is rare and it's amazing. But for the most part, they they haven't seen Filipino literature until now. I felt like we belonged into some kind of weird movement when when mm. we were all coming up in the night in late nineties. We were all kind of like mm-hmm. migrated towards each other, and we had yeah. this thing going. Yeah. On. It was wild. And, and I love the way we kind of like stuck together and, and yeah. um, see each other grow in that sense. So you stated that you're you're getting more interest, right? And you're watching your classes grow in size and stuff. Why do you think they're, do you think they're more interested in it now that they're exposed to um, it? This, or? I think so. I mean, there's a few things happening. There are mm-hmm. very limited number of Philippine studies programs in this country. I happen to be at one of like three or four of them in the country, right? Um, so there's that wow. piece. Um, and, you know, our, my, uh, you know, the, my fellow teachers are, you know, like, always trying to make connections with the students to, to, you know, to show them we're here. We want to connect with you. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's that there's the, the, you know, the, the outreach aspect, the fact that, you know, like you have to tell them we exist. Um, and that also that our classes, you know, I, I was languishing for a long time because my classes were electives and nobody had any time to fit them into their schedules. But, um, you know, we had had to we had to get these courses to become university requirements wow. right and yes. so the people who take my classes are taking my classes because it fulfills the university literature requirement and i'm like yeah that's kind of how you have to do it um huh. because you know when I, when i when i was in college it was a whole different thing where you know i would just take classes and not care whether or not they fulfilled my graduation requirement but these days i don't know that students have the luxury of that anymore it has to be a class entirely about filipinos writing creative writing 
wow, right? And so we all win. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting because mm-hmm. I had my Jack Kerouac be- yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, phase, you know, before I kind of like really got exposed to the whole world of poetry. And my first exposure was at a community college. That mm-hmm. was it. It was all yep. over. I, mm-hmm. I took that that class and I was like, this is what I do. Yeah. So I'm not surprised to find that you majored in ethnic studies as well as an, an MFA in creative writing because um, you you seem to be a vocal advocate for people of color and Pinay writers and are mm-hmm. always promoting Filipina and Filipino American writers and poets. How did you come to be an activist? I want to say, or are you um, against injustice and invisibility in creative expression across the <laughs> diaspora? You know, I am. Um... I don't really use that word to describe myself. Um, I know other people would. um, So I don't, you know, I I wouldn't say don't call me that. I just never Mm -hmm. use it for myself. Um, But, you know, I have to look at people like Eileen Tabios and Nick Carbo. They were, you know, they were my mentors. They were the ones who showed me how it's done basically, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, Eileen would always say to promote yourself, promote others, right? Um, Yeah, And I love that because, you know, I think, again, it's one of those situations where we all win. Um, And so also that goes very hand in hand with what it is that I teach my students about Filipinoness, where, you know, we always talk about like, um, you know, the core values of Kapwa, right? The shared humanity where we do Mm -hmm. acknowledge and, uh, you know, we acknowledge one another, as human, you know, as opposed to just kind of treating one another as like somebody to get you to the next uh, CV item, right? Right. Or the next editor. Um, So that, you know, I, and I feel like so much of that happens in this literary industry. I really dislike it, you know? So Mm -hmm. it feels really, really good to be able to go back to these core values that, you know, we were raised with, or at least I was raised with. I don't know that I use the word Kapwa, but everything that, you know, like growing up in my family, we always considered one another. Mm-hmm. And when I was younger, I felt like it was this, you know, ugh, I felt so like tied to it and I hated it because I wanted to go um, be, you know, my own thing. But I realized that 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 network and that, um, you know, those bonds of, of, you know, holding one another up is something that is really, truly very important to me, you know? So, um, for, you know, for me to kind of say, I want to follow in the shoes of Eileen Tabios or, or Nick Carbo because of the kind of, you know, advocacy and support right. and, you know, right. that, you know, that they showed me, um, this is how you do it. Um, exactly. and that's, how, and that's kind of what I want to, you know, that this is the example that I'm putting out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want the people around me using me as, you know, as this kind of resource to get to the next step. And I certainly don't want people around me treating one another that way. You know, so there's um, that. I have to say, reading your work as a Filipino American writer myself, your work validates mine as well. Mm-hmm. Can I read just a little section of sure. your um, poem, which really, really moved me? It's an invocation to daughters. So mm-hmm. it, invocation to daughters. Daughters, our world is beyond unkind. We know it is downright brutal. We have no haven. We have known only words for our bodies, such as commerce, coercion. A passive language strips us of our kick and grit and fight in our bloodlines. A vulgar language attributes our survival to others benevolence, belying our scars, true, cruel sources. A language of consumption frames our humanity as thighs, breasts, and eggs. A language of proprietorship brands and cages us. That's, to me, it's so powerful. And I noticed that you also, in, in, in most of your poems, you have, I love the way you play the Tagalog 
and uh-huh. the Spanish. Oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that interplay. And it's oh, almost you. because you are immersed, you're in San Francisco. So you have that uh-huh. too. But also it's almost because of, you know, being that the Philippines has been under Spanish rule for 200 years and all that language is a part of that heritage as well. It speaks to the very core Mm -hmm. um, and you Mm -hmm. speak to the daughter's our future, you know, yep. because our heritage in our, our past that used to chain us, you know. I want to go back to that thing you said about, you know, the Tagalog and the Spanish for real, right? I, um, one of my um, dear friends here in the Bay Area uh, is Edwin Lozada, right, who is yes. um, the leader of PAWA, Philippine American Writers and Artists. And he is a very talented poet. If you read his Spanish poetry, mm-hmm. it's gorgeous. Okay. Um, and so actually, when I started writing Poeta in San Francisco years and years and years and years ago, um, I remember sitting down with him and, um, you know, kind of asking him about, you know, the Spanish. Because I used to, um, in, in grad school, I, I remember looking for a translation of uh, Jose Rizal's poem, Mi Ultimo Adios, and I came across his, uh, Edwin's translation of it. And I, I used that in one of the graduate seminars that I um, that I was in at the time. It was a craft a translation course but um i remember we were talking and he said you know think about all of these cultural values that we uh, you know that we practice every day and that are so very deeply a part of us um you know and and a lot of that really does come from uh the spanish yes they came and and they colonized us and um you know but can you take those pieces away from you uh what a concept. You know, and I was, yeah, I was like, probably not, right? Like, mm-hmm. I could have never, ever, I would have never looked at my grandmother, my mother's mother, and see how religious she was. I could never tell her that she was colonized. You know, mm-hmm. that would just be so disrespectful, because this is a woman whose faith made her such a great human being. Right. right. So, Same as my mom so too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And, and so like, you know, so, you know, so I think that that really kind of gave me permission to go into language and just do it. Just, you know, just do it. Um, there was really no reason not to. Yeah, I am in um, the Bay Area where every language you hear in the street isn't mm-hmm. going to be English, right? And um, whether it is the the Tagalog English, the Taglish that, you know, happens in my own family and in my own interactions or, you know, um, the Spanish that you hear in the streets, the Spanish you hear in my family, my, uh, you know, like Oscar, my, my partner. Um, oh, that's so politically correct, right? Oscar is my husband. He, um, you know, he <laughs> speaks Spanish and, um, uh, you know, and so like these are languages that we live every day in mm-hmm. and um they're so musical and beautiful sounding to me and um sometimes you get to those tagalog or spanish words that feel more correct than the english one to use anyway and i um, love the the, yeah. the um, interplay with the variations of spelling in the same spanish mm-hmm. word yeah. when you say it it seems like the same word but you have to see you know the Tagalog. Ah, yes, yes. Can Can you tell the audience what inspires you, or are you more pragmatic about it? Like Eileen is more pragmatic about the oh. creative process and the term inspiration. Do you look for inspiration, or are you just a, a work ethic type poet too? Maybe I am a work ethic type poet. I think that's probably the best way to describe me at this point, right? Which isn't mm-hmm. to say that I'm never inspired, right? right but I, right. Um, I, um, you know, like, I don't know what it is that moved me to ask all these Filipinas to ask me questions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I just knew that that was something that I wanted to do. And, um, and you know, maybe a lot of it just comes from it, um, in my daily life, Filipinas are always asking me questions, whether it is about school or about writing or, or, you know, something, how do I navigate this? How would I go about doing that? And so, you know, maybe it's that, that I have been, you know, kind of my ethic has been about Kapwa and cooperation and collaboration. Right. And so 
the writing that comes out of that typically is um, work that is directed at the askers, these other Filipinas, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. so that focuses my writing, how I write, what kind of language I use, what kind of tone I use, right? It's very located. Um, And then when I'm in that groove, I am in that groove and I just go with it, you know? Um, And um, yeah, so maybe... I don't know if that is more pragmatic or, you know, I I don't really know how else to describe that piece. But I just know that once I get myself in a groove like that, I just I go. Do you find teaching fuels your your creative process? You like the way you want to explore things Mm -hmm. more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so, because I'm constantly in a state of articulation. Right. Mm -hmm. So the way you um, put it, yeah. And yeah, and and especially because I am, you know, I'm the Filipina, Filipina lit teacher, right? Um, Right. And so it's so normalized to talk about the Filipina experience, not as this exotic thing or this thing to dissect. And it just is, it's at the center of the thing, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so being able to like take this um, the Filipina experience or Filipina voice or Filipina, as Alison Tintianco would say, Filipina epistemology, right? Um, right. And just keep expanding it, finding all of the details and really kind of like mining it. Um, it's been a, it's been a privilege, right? Because typically like somebody from the outside will look at it and go like, okay, that's Filipina, maybe have one thing to say about it and move on. You know, mm-hmm. they take mm-hmm. they don't need to be excavating it the way I'm doing on a daily basis, very, very deeply and meticulously, you know, and um, and uh, my students there's so many young Filipinas that do come through my classrooms, you know, when they see that happening, you see them transform right. in a lot of my interviews where I say I've always I go back to that 19 year old Filipina that I was picking up a pin, you know, a book written by a pinai for the first time. And I see that year in, year out, um, you know, in my classroom. So it makes it very easy to write to them. Yeah, yeah, I do. Were you shy? Were you like afraid to ask questions or go down that road? Um, Uh, When was my, uh, you know what? I don't even remember. I think that the first Penai teacher I ever had would have been either my Tagalog teacher at UC Berkeley or no, Christina Hidalgo at University of the Philippines. Oh, wow. So I was already in my twenties. Right. Um, uh-huh. but, um, you know, and by the time I was in, um, professor Hidalgo's class, you know, I was just nothing but needing to talk and listen and write mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. be emotional, you know, um, that's where I was. But yeah. prior to that, you know, before having a professor like that, you know, I was like, Um, I was just really hungry, but I didn't know what I was hungry for. Do you have any like weird rituals? Like, do you wake up early to write? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I don't, I can't do that wake up early business. I really can't. (laughs) I I wake up, I shower, I get my coffee. I'm on a bus across Oakland to go to work. Right. Um, Uh And so I typically write in, um, I, I write in very compressed spaces, I guess, uh-huh. right? I like, hear you. Yeah. I, I have a full-time job in a, in addition to teaching, so I will always have wow. my notebook. Yeah. You have so a full-time will, job on top I do. of teaching? I wow. do. I, um, so I always have my notebook with me, and I always have my Google document open on my computer, mm-hmm. and if it comes, it comes, right? Yeah. Um, And so that, I don't know that that constitutes a ritual, but that definitely is like, I have to have these things in place. Yes. I definitely have to have these things in place. Um, And then I just write. And um, maybe you see that, maybe people who read my work see it in my work, how it moves, how fast it moves. Yeah, Um, That's definitely the velocity with which I am moving through this city uh-huh. into that city into that uh-huh. classroom into this office onto this right. bus interesting you yeah. said that see that's yeah. that's yeah. the interesting tidbit i wanted to know like you can actually see how the rhythm i want to call it the rhythm of yes. how your collection works and moves so mm-hmm. when you're not 
writing, what do you enjoy? I mean, you got so many things going on in your life too, as, as I do. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I have to tell you something about music, right? The music of the work. Um, hiking. I mean, I, um, you know, part of the way that you move, well, well, let me start over the way that you move in the world influences your poetic lines. Right. And mm-hmm. so there's a kind of music that happens for me when I'm, you know, you know, like on a hiking trail and just plowing through and hearing nothing but my feet or nothing yeah. but my breath. Right. Um, right. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I go, okay, the music is coming here. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of that. And then I start like, and then I realize when I'm under the redwoods up in the Oakland Hills, you know, that like, oh, wait, wait a second. My language is changing. I'm looking at texture here. I'm, uh-huh. I'm smelling things that I, smelling things I need to find language for. Um, and then, yes. you know, like after the rains under the redwoods, there's these crazy mushrooms that grow, you know, like, so that, that stuff, those kinds of layers of stuff uh-huh. tangled together um, and growing and decaying and whatever that makes it, I think, into, into the work as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Even those little things that and I tend to see things that maybe most people don't, you know. Yeah, maybe other people wouldn't necessarily hone in on that thing. Right. Um, (laughs) Or think about like that smell versus that other smell or, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Or this mud versus that mud, (laughs) you know, or um, yeah, yeah, totally. Right. But that's that's why we write. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm always fascinated about writers and their personal relationships. Mm-hmm. I mean, we almost kind of feel solitary here in Florida. You know, I don't mm-hmm. really have too many writer friends. Mm-hmm. Like you guys have like the Metro, you know, Bay Area, and you guys have such a great community out there. And I have this obsession, like with Sylvia yeah. Plath, Ted Hughes, uh-huh. yeah. Peter Paolo, Diego Rivera. Yeah. So I, I don't, I'm not making comparisons or prying into your personal mm-hmm, relationships, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I noticed you said you have a poet husband. I do. <laughs> and we met because... through poetry, yeah. See? Oh my yes, God. Yes, yes, we did. We <laughs> met through poetry and we met because we were both linked to Patrick Rosal's blog back in the days Get when we were blogging on oh author, right? Um, so Patrick was the our, you know, one of the elements that Oscar and I had in common. But you know, so so we found each other through poetry. That's the first thing. But then, like, um, you know, and I and I guess I should say the thing that um, you know where where poetry is in our lives, and 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 I love that um, Oscar is um, he's one of my toughest readers. Um, he will read one of my poems that everybody else is super excited about. And he'll just go, "Eh, eh." (laughs) you know, and, and not because he's being like, not, not because he's writing my ass or anything. You know, he's, he's just saying like, I know you can do better. Mm. Right. Like he can tell me that I'm phoning a thing in. Uh Right. Like that is the hard truth that a lot of people won't tell you. Um, so in that, that's why I always think he is my hardest and best reader. And right? that's what because I hear about the um, uh, writers, poets, couples mm-hmm. like that. They are kind of like they, you know, read each other's work and they edit and they, they, I don't have that. So I was like, I don't. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's good and bad about it. We'll, I'm we'll, sure, you know, right? You know, we give each other space from, you know, like I don't get into his work unless he asks me to, you know. Um, oh, so and, you kind of have and, like the boundaries and yeah, things like that. Yeah, I think yeah, we have absolutely. to, you know. Um, and then also, like, I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of artist couples that end up not working for various mm-hmm. reasons. And it might be because of vanity or because of ego. Um, but for us, I feel as though, right. Um, I cannot like, I can't take it personally when he says, no, I think you're phoning that in. I think that it, this shows me that he really cares, you Mm -hmm. know, like if he didn't care, if he didn't love me as much as I think he does, (laughs) but just let it go and not care to give me his opinion. Right. And, um, we have to exist in this same space together. We live in the city. So our, our spot is, is cozy, you know, Mm -hmm. and we have to be able to like, 
you know, respect that the space and the boundaries and how, you know, and then also we have these great poetics conversations (sighs) just in commute. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. right. Or yeah, you know, so those things happen, but I, I feel as though like, it's not as though we, we said to each other, we have to agree on this thing. No, I think that it kind of organically, you know, the way that we work with or, or around one another is mm-hmm. something that has happened organically. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for coming on to this show and letting oh my God. us know more about you and your work. I, I've, like I said, literally known you for years and uh, no, you know, it's, it's great to actually hear you be and one day I'll together. be able to yes. see you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Our paths will cross someday. These are our lives these days. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I will certainly be following you closely and um, watching all your 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 new accomplishments and publications. And I wish you well. And thank you again for um, being my featured guest this time. Who knows where this takes us? (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much for this. This is awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we'll keep in touch. And like Mm -hmm. I said, because my my book of poetry is coming out. Um, any day now. I know mm-hmm. Eileen ordered it and it's Exciting. Been uh-huh. a little bit delayed. I was trying to um, schedule a reading out there somewhere. So we'll keep in touch and hopefully yes, maybe that'll please. be a uh-huh. great time to finally meet each other and all. Absolutely. Everyone, that's it for now. Stay tuned and listen next week as I feature another poet. Um, I hope you all have a great productive and creative week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye, Barbara.